Okay, it's five minutes past four, so uh, let's make a start. Hi, everybody. Salam alaikum, and welcome to this event in solidarity with Palestine, co-organized by the Critical Ancient World Studies Collective and Everyday Orientalism. My name is Chella Ward. I'm lecturer in classical studies at the Open University, and I also co-convene together with Mother Umachandran, the Critical Ancient World Studies Collective. Today's event has been put together by the two of us and by Everyday Orientalism's Catherine Blouin, Rachel Mares, and Usama Ali Gad. On behalf of all of us organizers, I'd like to thank you for joining us for this afternoon's meeting. I'm conscious that there's a huge amount to say this afternoon and very little time to say it in. So um, I'm not going to spend too much time recounting all of the reasons why this meeting is being held or list the atrocities perpetrated against the Palestinian people either as part of the current escalation of aggression against them, aggression to which many experts have given the title genocide, or as part of the 75-year illegal occupation of the Palestinian territories that preceded October the 7th, 2024. I do, however, want to begin by saying that one of the motivating factors for this event was the organizers' collective disappointment with the apathy and lack of leadership on the issue of Palestinian solidarity from major subject organizations within classics, archeology span and ancient history. Many of you who are attending today are no doubt aware that putting together this event drew the ire of many within these disciplines who used abusive language, false accusations, including of anti-Semitism and of support for prescribed organizations and unintellectual, unintellectual claims that the study of the ancient past ought to be apolitical to dissuade us from organizing this event. If we're here today, it's because we do not at all agree that our disciplines are apolitical and nor would any of us wish for them to be so. I'd also like to begin this meeting by stating that we as the organizers will not tolerate at this event any of the types of uh, language, intimidation or false accusation that we've seen played out in venues like the Liverpool Classicist Listserv and other mailing lists this week. Hate speech of any kind, be it Islamophobic, anti-Semitic or otherwise hateful, will not be tolerated and anyone who engages in it will be removed from this meeting by the moderators without warning. And as I make these comments about the need to engage with this event productively and respectfully, I'd also like to take the opportunity to remind you of the importance of academic freedom and that evidence-based criticism of a state and its policies does not itself constitute hate speech, although it may do so if it employs tropes or assumptions that are hateful in nature. This event then will take the form of a webinar. You won't be able to use your camera or your microphone at any point, and the chat will remain unavailable to you throughout. There'll be an opportunity towards the end of the meeting for you to ask questions though, by putting them into the Q&A box. I'll begin now by uh, introducing each of the panelists in the order in which they'll speak and then I'll pass to each one of them in turn to make their short remarks. I'm really, really delighted to have such an incredible panel of speakers for you to engage with today. I hope I'll have the opportunity to say so at more length at the end of this event, but I want to thank them on behalf of the organizers for their time, their intellect, their expertise, and perhaps most importantly, their solidarity. The first speaker whose words you will hear today is Fadl Alatul. Fadl was born in the Al Shati refugee camp in 1981 and has been working with the École Biblique et Archéologique Française of Jerusalem on their excavations in Gaza since 1997. In September of this year, it was widely reported that Fadl had been part of a team that discovered four Roman tombs in the Gaza Strip, taking the total number of Roman tombs that had been discovered in this Roman cemetery to 134, dating between the 1st century BCE and the 2nd century CE. Since 2017, Fadl has been part of an important workforce known as Progress 2030, whose remit is the protection and restoration of all archaeological sites in Gaza. Fadl had planned to join us from Gaza, um, but because of the communications blockade, uh, he's not able to. So his uh, presentation that he's provided to us will be read by Abdullah Majid of the University of Toronto's Hearing Palestine Project. Once we've heard from Fadl, we'll hear from two further heritage professionals. Georgia M. Andreu will speak first, a senior researcher at the Centre for Maritime Archaeology at the University of Southampton, 
and Associate Lecturer in Near Eastern Archaeology at University College London. Since 2022, Georgia has been the Director of the Gaza Maritime Archaeology Project, documenting sites primarily in Deir el Bala. We'll then hear from Isbeth Sabrina, a Syrian archaeologist who specializes in cultural heritage management during conflicts. He is the chair of the international NGO Heritage for Peace, and he's also the founder and director of the Arab Network of Civil Society Organizations to Safeguard Cultural Heritage. We'll hear from Sabia Alouche, who is lecturer in Middle East politics at the University of Exeter. Sabia's work engages with feminist approaches to violence, conflict, and migration, and is dedicated to rethinking regimes of sex and gender in the Middle East and North Africa region beyond Eurocentric theoretical frames. Next, we'll move on to two speakers who have been long-standing friends and inspirations for the Critical Ancient World Studies project. Santiago Slobodsky is an Argentinian social theorist who holds the Kaufman Chair in Jewish Studies at Hofstra University in New York. Among his many publications, his book, Decolonial Judaism, Triumphal Failures of Barbaric Thinking, received the 2017 Franz Fanon Outstanding Book Award from the Caribbean Philosophical Association. He will be followed by Salman Sayed, who is Professor of Rhetoric and Decolonial Thought at Leeds University. Among his many important publications, his books, Fundamental Fear, Eurocentrism and the Emergence of Islamism, and Recalling the Caliphate, Decolonization and World Order, have been translated into several languages. He convenes the Critical Muslim Studies Project, and he's also the editor of the interdisciplinary journal, Reorient. Our final speaker will be Aditi Rao, a third year graduate student in Princeton's Classics Department. Aditi works on Indian encounters, Indian and Greek encounters in the Seleucid worlds, and on the construction of anti-Indo-European philologies. She's also an active organizer in the movement for Palestinian liberation, and also works on a number of other campaigns, including anti-carcerialism and demilitarization. Each of these speakers will speak for about eight minutes, no longer than eight minutes, in fact, will be relatively strict, um, and then we will take questions. So please uh, keep a note of any questions you'd like to ask, and we'll open the Q&A box at the end of the presentations. I'm really, really looking forward to hearing from all of these fantastic colleagues. Uh, so without further ado, let's make a start. Um, Abdullah, uh, can I invite you to, to get started? All right, thank you, Marcella. So I'll jump right into it. Um, archaeological sites in Gaza are archaeological sites like any archaeological sites in the world. They are a product of an ancient civilization. Archaeological sites are sites that prove the existence of ancient civilizations and their history as a legacy for every free citizen in Gaza and their heritage. These sites are protected by international laws. They should not be politicized. They are civilian sites, not military sites. They are sites protected by the Geneva Convention. It must be the duty of every human being on the face of the earth to protect them because they do not cause an existential danger to any human being. Rather, they express the shared human culture, liveliness, and beauty of ancient life. And they prove how Asian people lived in harmony without borders or dams. This means that they must be protected and not destroyed. Destroying archaeological sites indicates the hatred of those who destroy them because they do not want to tolerate culture and protect religious harmony. Gaza's archaeological sites are a testimony and evidence of religious tolerance. There are several Byzantine and Islamic archaeological sites in Gaza, and destroying archaeological sites means demolishing culture and demolishing the act of ancient man-made, and which also means demolishing and destroying the cultural heritage of the citizens of Gaza. Moreover, this destruction means the destruction of the basic foundations of human shared culture. I personally did not cry over my home from which I and the rest of my family were forcibly displaced from against my will just as much as I cried over the almost complete destruction of the old city of Gaza, which contains churches, mosques, ancient houses, archaeological museums, and artifacts. I do not know why the archaeological sites are destroyed. What did they do to those who were destroying them? What danger did they cause to be destroyed? I am waiting for the end of this war that burns stones, trees, and people so that I can document this destruction. Thank you. Thank you, Abdullah. Uh, Georgia. 
While witnessing the most horrific and indiscriminate erasure of life in Gaza, our community, a community that has and continues to benefit immensely from the history, heritage, and experiences of people in the Middle East, has responded in disappointing and predictable ways. Some have expressed solidarity in public, most privately. Some responded with attacks, silencing, and doxing. Some with blackmailing institutions and professional organizations to produce one-sided or sterilized statements. Many focused exclusively on what they view as universal values of heritage and emphasized its protection completely detached from local communities, some of which killed while seeking shelter in heritage sites. Even more people chased yet another crisis to attract funding and increase their visibility often without any previous meaningful engagement with heritage in Gaza, nor its people. Today, I choose to highlight the work of Gazan archaeologists, our colleagues, who are rarely included in heritage discourses and whose views, like much of the intellectual work of communities in the region, has historically been dismissed as biased, vernacular, or non-academic. Over the past two years, Yasmin El Khudari and I have been directing an archaeological project in the Gaza Strip, where I had the fortune to work with the most motivated, creative, resilient, and hardworking students. Our project developed a network of professionals, the complementary skills of whom would enable a sustainable documentation of sites and hopefully, hopefully future archaeological activity independent from foreign expertise. This knowledge exchange network involved heritage professionals, local media production companies, topographical and coastal engineers, divers, as well as GIS and archaeology students from the Islamic University of Gaza, who joined their skills to identify practical approaches to monitoring heritage with which they had developed effective ties. The delivery of the project depended on a long list of restrictions actively preventing the development of capacity. Restrictions ranged from accessing surveying equipment such as GPS and cameras to trowels and even snorkeling masks. What seemed like the creative solution solutions to account for constantly interrupted access to electricity and internet was the student's way of living. Next slide, please. The students used open access software to comprehensively document archaeological sites along Wadi Gaza and along the coast of Deir el-Ballah and Han Yunis. Next, please. They carried their work with pride and expanded the project with ethnographic interviews and community engagement. Next, please. Muadassin Habib, the student who took the photo on the left, was the first student killed in October 2023. Muadassin had just graduated and his family was very proud of his accomplishment. Within the same week, Ibrahim Lafi, a young photojournalist who trained archaeologists on aerial survey, was killed while reporting. The next day, Tasnim Basim and her family were injured in their home in a refugee camp as it was reduced to rubble. A couple of weeks later, our partner Rushdi Saraj, which you see on the photo on the top right, was killed in front of his wife and months old daughter in their house. All 20 students I have engaged with are displaced and have experienced unimaginable horrors. At present, I'm only able to contact two who sometimes have access to the internet. With their permission, I will share some of their words. Ahmed is a GIS student from the Islamic University of Gaza. His dream is to finish his degree, travel, and get a job in his field. When the war began, he told me not to worry, as he is used to being bombed, and he has no intention of leaving his home. When I asked how I can help, Ahmed said, I'm living in literal hell. Please pray for us as governments and decision makers are doing nothing. He then asked me to check in satellite imagery if his house was still intact. It was destroyed. Ahmed and his family have moved to numerous locations seeking shelter. While he made a promise to himself not to give up hope, being located at the north and with sporadic access to food, he fears of dying of starvation. Now moving to the next student. Ali finished his third year studying history and archaeology at the Islamic University of Gaza. His dream is to do a master's and get work experience abroad. Over the past several weeks, Ali and his family are living in tents next to the border in Rafah, 
hoping to travel to Egypt. Ali wanted me to share his message. We suffer a lot here. There's no water, no electricity, no clean food, and no decent life. They destroyed our homes in which we were raised throughout our lives, and we do not know where we to go. We're literally dying here. Every single day we think is our last. Every single day a person we know is killed. If I don't die from an airstrike, I'll die of some disease. I'm surrounded by garbage and sewage. Every day I see blood, body parts, and people dismembered before my eyes. What did I do to deserve that? The destruction of heritage is one of many types of violence Gazans are subjected to, and we observe it on every level. Destruction of collective memory, removal of entire families from the register, destruction of built and natural environment, archives, museums, universities, removing any memory of the past and any hope for the future. The destruction of educational infrastructure has affected an approximate 90,000 university students, obliterating prospects for their future. Sadly, it has become clear that there isn't much we can practically do to help. Next slide. As people working in academic institutions and as people that have benefited from these communities to promote our careers and to pursue topics that simply interest us, now is the time to show solidarity. Please urge your institution to revise their admission policies to consider students that have lost their transcripts. Urge your institutions and professional organizations to offer scholarships to Gazans as they do for other displaced students. Please enhance and share a list of scholarships that can help the students. This list, I have it pinned on my ex account. You can also request it via email and we can also make it available through this event. Thank you for attending this event and thank you for organizing this event. Thank you, Georgia. Um, I just heard that uh, Fadal Alatul, who I explained wasn't able to join us, in fact, has been able to join us. Um, so we're going to ask him now if there's anything that he would like to add. Um, Abdullah, can I ask you please uh, to explain to Fadl that we have heard his words, but if there's anything that he'd like to add, he's very, very welcome to do so. And can you thank him very much on our behalf for joining us? Thank you. Marhaba Fadl, awalan ahlan wa sahlan bik. Qarayna al statement al arsal tinnaya. I don't know if that connection ta'a kwaisa. Fi ayy ishi haba al-dhifu bil bidaya. ما أعرف إذا عم تسمعنا فضل I think the connection keeps going back yeah. and forth. It, it might be that the connection is not good enough um, We will perhaps try again a little bit later on uh, Thank you Abdullah um, let's go on to the next speaker then, and and um, we'll we'll try to come back to Fadl if we can get a connection. Um, Isbeh. Is there everyone? Uh -huh. Yes. Uh, good afternoon, Good afternoon, everyone. Mr. Khair, Jamal. Can you give it? I'm Nismaq, brother. Yes, Mr. Khair, Jamal. How are you? I'm good. 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 He says, I'm sorry that the connection is not fully connected, that I had uh, a long time to try to reach you out. And today is a very cold day, uh, and we hope that all days are this cold and the war will end soon and the weather will cool down and the whole atmosphere will cool down. 
واحنا بنعرف يعني انه 12 يوم تقريبا مقطوع الاتصال على التوالي اليوم مقطوع الاتصال والانترنت وانا اليوم قريب على الحدود المصريه عشان اتواصل معك وعشان اكون معك ان شاء الله واحكي عن الاوضاع بغزه والمواقع الاثريه اللي بغزة. And I know for the past 12 days the connection has been almost non-existent um, and I tried my best to reach out. Today I came to the Egyptian border only to be able with you and speak with you about the conditions in Gaza. يعني أنا سعيد جدا جدا بوجودي معكم بصراحة يعني أنا أنا الوقت متأخر هام كتير وأنا قاطع مسافة كتير أولا يعني غير آمن جدا يعني غير آمن كتير بس حابب أن يكون عن غير آمن بس أنا حابب يبقى شيء بيوصل بالصوت من غزة اليوم بحكي معكم وأنه يمكن أنت سمعين صوتي مع صوت الطيران وهذه الطائرات والزنانات وطائرات تطلع وطبعا إحنا بنعرف أنه القصف الإسرائيلي والتدمير الإسرائيلي And I know you and I know that you have uh, have got a long path just to be with you today and to hear your to the for you to hear my voice and i think that you can hear my voice along with the voice of the airplanes and the drones that are flying above us uh, but it's important for me to be here today so that you can hear all of this وانا طبعا اليوم حابب احكي لكم او اقول لكم شيء مباشر يعني من ثلاث ايام طبعا انا لن ما اعرف طعم النوم من القلق اللي احنا موجودين فيه بغزه لانه انا عندنا مخزن للاثار للقطع الاثريه هو متكون تقريبا من 4000 قطعه اثريه من تنقيبات حصلنا عليها والجيش الاسرائيلي وقف فيها موجود فيها حاليا وبيصدر صور على الانترنت هي معروضه على الانترنت انهم حاطين على مخزن للقطع الاثريه وجابوا نائب رئيس سلطة الآثار الإسرائيلي أنا آسف حاحكي بسرعة لأنه الإنترنت حيفصل معي بسرعة تقريبا فعشان هيك أنا حابب أحكي تمام um, and I should say that I haven't slept in the past three days because in the past period the Israeli army has seized and occupied one of the main storages that we have which includes 4,000 artifacts and they have released images that they have seized this storage on the internet and on social media. Um, and then he also said that he'll speak quickly because the connection might go off uh, very fast. المدارس الفرنسية الصولية الفرنسية حتى الداعمين ريتش كونسل البريطاني بيعرف بهذا المخزن والقطع الأثرية هذا المخزن آمن يعني والكل بيعرف أنه هذا بيحتوي فقط القطع الأثرية فقط And this, this storage and this uh, center is known globally, worldwide uh, It is known by the UNESCO, it is known by the British Bridge, it is known by the French schools and we all know that it only includes artifacts, nothing else. Tawadal Fadal. Fadal, am tismana? ما عم نسمع صوتك فضل فضل yeah, I can't hear. I don't think I think connection whistles. Okay, I think I think we might have lost the connection. Um, but thank you ever so much, Fadal, uh, for being here and for sharing those uh, important uh, events with us. Um, we our thoughts are with you. Um, and may Allah keep you and your family safe. Um, let's move on then with uh, the next presenter, um, Isbe. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for really to organize this important webinar. Uh, 
بس احنا مين بنعرف كان يكسب بيجي وقت ويروح فضل آه فضل ممكن تعيد الحكاية ده بيحكي انا اسف على الانقطاع الانقطاع الاتصال I'm sorry for the disconnection طيب إيه كمان احنا هل ناهيك عن المخزن القطع الاثريه طبعا والمواقع الاثريه كمان اللي بغزه هي مواقع مدنيه ثقافيه بحت لانه احنا بنعرف غزه عبر العصور يعني بنحكي عن مواقع اثريه فظيعه عندنا 320 موقع اثري Besides the besides the storage facility, which includes these 4,000 artifacts, what we know in Gaza is that we also have more than 320 archaeological sites. These are civilian sites, only archaeological sites, and only civilian sites that have been known historically. كمان إنه عنا كمان مواقع الأثرية هي مواقع إن معروفة على قائمة اليونسكو المؤقتة وتعرضت للتدمير زي موقع البلخية وأنا شفت بعض الفيديوهات في داخل هذا الموقع وهذا الموقع بيتعرض للتدمير والتجريف. And besides that, we also have sites that are known by the UNESCO, uh, including uh, the Blachia site, which was destroyed and uprooted. And I have seen videos by of it being destroyed and being uprooted from the earth, from the soil. تعرضت للتدمير والتقصير والقاصف لحتى الان انا بعرف التدمير من اجزاء منها ما بعرف بالضبط لانها هي منطقه عسكريه. And the Byzantine church has also been destroyed and it has been bombed and airstriked. And I have seen some videos of destruction but I'm not entirely sure what has happened to it right now. It is also has been occupied as a military zone, the region around it. أفضل كمل أنا أسمعك أفضل ما أعرف إذا عم تسمعنا أو لا Uh, فضل ما سمعت كويس ما تقدر تعيد صوتك قطع شويه فضل ممكن تعيد الحكي اللي حكيته شويه صوتك قطع معي Yeah, I think the connection is too is too poor. فضل ما ما أعرف إذا في عندك نقاط أخرى ممكن تحب تضيفها إذا الصوت عم بيوصل وإذا عم تسمعني بعتقد إنه الصوت كثير عم بيوصلك متقطع. بس إذا في نقاط أخيرة بدك تضيفها مهمة جدا إنه إحنا نسمعها هلا حاول تضيفها إذا تقدر I think I think فضل disconnected yeah yeah okay um, just checking that he's not managed to reconnect no I think he hasn't so I think um, perhaps it's best that we I think he's, I think he's back right now but uh, yeah أنا آسف يعني كثير على الانقطاع المتواصل مش مشكلة فضل في عندك نقاط مش مشكلة حتى إذا أخاف النت يقطع أو الاتصال يقطع هو أنا لو بدي أحكي عن التدمير والتدمير اللي بيصير على المواقع الأثرية يعني بدي أيام كثيرة أنا I would, I would need days to speak about all the destruction of the archaeological sites that we've been witnessing 
عندي توثيق لبعض الاماكن الاثريه والمواقع الاثريه اللي تم تدميرها يعني احنا بنعرف وين بيوصل الدبابات والاجتياح الاسرائيلي بيتم تدمير كل شيء محادي لهذه الدبابات يعني والجيش الاسرائيلي We are documenting every form of assault on these archaeological sites and I have documented many of these assaults uh, around these areas whenever uh, an Israeli tank is uh, reaching that area. يعني عندي توثيق تقريبا لما يقارب ل 30% حاليا لغزه القديمه كل الاشياء القديمه اللي فيها تم تدميرها مثل حمام السمراء تم تدميره بالكامل المسجد العمري تم تدميره I have documented قصر البشر more than 30% of these areas in old Gaza city in particular that have been destroyed including the Masjid al-Umari the Umari mosque uh, the Hammam al-Samra and other areas وقصر الباشا اللي هو يحتوي على الاف القطع الاثريه المعروضه في داخل هذا المتحف واحنا محول هو قصر الباشا لمتحف ومعرض للقطع الاثريه اللي بتم الحصول عليها اثناء التنقيب الاثري في غزه. And the Qasr al-Basha Museum which also houses multiple thousands of uh, archaeological artifacts that have also been destroyed with the, with the museum. وانا وانا حاليا حاليا انا من ثلاث ايام بقرا اذا تم العبث في او نقل بعض القطع الاثريه الموجوده بهذا المخزن حتى هو موثقه بالكامل عندنا وموجوده عندنا بالكامل عندي صور قبل وصول الجيش الاسرائيلي لهذا المكان We also have documented that some of the artifacts have been relocated and I have some photos and images from before the Israeli army came into the areas and afterwards and into the museum and afterwards. Um, فضل احنا في عندنا دقائق قليله وراها لازم ننتقل ففي شيء ضروري بدك تحب تضيفه هلا اخر شيء؟ شكرا لكم ولاستماعكم انا هيني موجود معكم اذا حد اذا توقف Thank you. Thank you very much for listening and for joining. And I'll be here to ha- if you have any questions or anything to raise up. Shukran Fadl. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you ever so much for joining us. And our thoughts, as I said, are very much with you and with your family. Um, our next speaker, let's move on to Isbeh. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for organizing this uh, event. And it was great to hear uh, Fadl since almost more than 12 days was no possibility to connect him uh, in because of the cut of the internet in, in Gaza. So uh, here in this intervention, I, I am going to give a little bit an overview about uh, our work uh, and what we did so far in, in, in Gaza. I mean, I am myself Syrian. Uh, specialized on cultural heritage uh, in, in conflict. And uh, I never w- ever worked in Gaza before the war and before the recent war. And always I was interested to work in, in, in Gaza and to help as well on uh, the production and the management of cultural heritage. Uh, unfortunately, the war happened. And uh, when we, we uh, decided to intervene, It was like a very difficult decision as well. I mean, uh, our organization here, the for Peace, here we are uh, going to to give uh, a little uh, bit background about our organization. So, Heritage for Peace is an international group of heritage workers who believe that cultural heritage is a common ground for dialogue and a tool to build peace. Our mission is to support heritage workers in different of citizenship or religion as they work towards the production of cultural heritage for future generations. We are, and I confirm that we are a neutral organization. We work everywhere where it's, there is a need to document and to protect cultural heritage uh, in, in conflict. Uh, the war started, and I, I am as one of millions of people who were watching this uh, this war i mean for for us it was very hard just to to to, to see the news and to see the destruction in, in both sides i am talking as well in in the, the, that also i mean 
uh, uh, for us, it, it was also uh, difficult to, to, to see uh, how everyone is suffering in the beginning of, of this war. We decided that we need to document what, what is uh, uh, happening to here. It's, it's very difficult as well to think in a war like that to 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 to, uh, to, uh, to comment uh, here it is with the uh, uh, help and the support of uh, our colleagues and here I I want to confirm with uh, Dr Ahmed Burj he is uh, one of the uh, heritage experts and also he was leading uh, different projects I uh, uh, we started to 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 get the news and to slowly but surely trying to uh, 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 collect the information on the destruction. When we published uh, our first report on the 7th of November, with uh, our colleagues, we were able to identify about 104 uh, 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 four, uh, uh, sites, which they were affected in uh, during the conflict. This, these sites, uh, unfortunately, after that, some or a lot of them, they were destroyed totally. Uh, I am also connected mostly in every day to, to Fadel as well, and always talking about the, the news about heritage destruction. Uh, unfortunately, the war became uh, brutal and brutal, and it was very difficult to collect more information. So uh, since almost two, uh, yeah, since few weeks, we are trying as well to collect information in collaboration with some colleagues in uh, in, in UK with satellite imagery. I mean, uh, now, as I said, that uh, uh, there are a lot of destruction uh, happening, and also there are a lot of destruction of sites which they, we don't know. I mean, in Gaza, it's, it was full of, of, I mean, the archaeologists who work in Gaza, they know how how uh, uh, how Gaza is is rich in 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 in, in, in this. Uh, 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 with uh, heritage sites. Uh, so uh, our work as well in, in Gaza, it's through our initiatives, uh, ANSH, the Arab Network of Civil Society. So in, within uh, ANSH, we have a lot of uh, contacts with locals in the ground, in, in Syria, in Yemen, in Sudan, in Gaza. Uh, and with, with it, I mean, we are trying as well to to uh, uh, to collect this information. This is some of our uh, calls. I am not going to uh, uh, talk about that. Uh, when we published the report on the 7th of November, it was a need. I mean, we uh, uh, every conflict when happened, and we we are from our experience, we saw that uh, there are a lot of 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 uh, uh, work in order in the media as well to document or, or to report. But in Gaza, it was nothing happened about that. And we know that the uh, shelling and the attacks of the uh, uh, city center of Gaza during the first days of the war. Uh, so there was a need. I mean, we needed to document that there is another crime is happening, which is uh, this uh, the, uh, the destruction of cultural heritage. Um, we were very surprised when our first report was, uh, uh, was published. We got a lot of... Uh, uh, media attention. I mean, the RT newspapers, the uh, BBC, Al Jazeera, NPR, uh, RT News, a lot, a lot of uh, media uh, reports. And this was our objective. We was uh, just we know we wanted to highlight that there is another big crime is happening against the Palestinian in Gaza, which is the destruction of cultural heritage. We as well. I mean. Uh, we looked that this really we after this first uh, report we need to continue on that, and we are trying as well to hopefully soon we will publish our second report. What I want to say here, there are some remarks and something which I I I I think we 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 uh, uh, we need to to consider. It was uh, uh, very shocking how the war the world. Uh, uh, reacted as well uh, against the cultural heritage destruction in Gaza. I mean, we didn't hear from other, I, I mean, uh, 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 cultural organizations about about that this is should be reported. This should be uh, as well uh, 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 mentioning that 
this is another uh, big tragedy is happening. We we were as well uh, in the end. I think there is uh, uh, the Palestinian as well. They have the right to protect these heritage, and uh, 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 they have as well the cultural heritage in Gaza is very needed as well to rebuild Gaza. We need the people in 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 in, uh, uh, in the world to consider that uh, the restructuring of Gaza is not is an humanitarian as well action for for the people. The Omari Mosque and other 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 uh, uh, important heritage sites are crucial for the life in Gaza. So those organi- those building and those uh, uh, sites they need to be really considered as a part for the reconstruction of of Gaza. We need at the end. I mean, this war shows that we cannot continue like that. The Israelis and the Palestinians they need to live together in peace. And heritage in 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 in, in Palestine is as well is an important element for for the peace. We Gaza, even before, and uh, is a very important uh, 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 site on uh, uh, territory for the diversity, the Christians. The uh, uh, Muslim, even Jewish, before they were living in Gaza. So Gaza, I mean, uh, is also need to to to. We need really to work as well. I I have even before this war, I, like um, the, a dream that we need to work through our shared heritage to build peace. I am. I have friends here who are hearing that. That really, we before the war, we needed to work and to think how we make the heritage as a search heritage in our uh, uh, in our uh, uh, in our region in Syria in, in Palestine. In that this heritage is unite us and it's a, an important tool as well to build peace. We cannot continue like that for the Israelis and for the Palestinian and for the Syrian for everyone in Middle East. We should stop this. And we should go to build peace. And our he- shared heritage in this region is all a tool to uh, make the peace. And we need to think is one of the elements. It's not, I mean, we need to arrive, and the Palestinian people they need to res- they need to be respected, and their heritage need to be respected and protected. So, thank you very much. This is my my, my statement. Thank you, um, Isbeer. Sabir. Hello, everyone. Thank you for um, uh, having me. Um, so I start my paper. Sometimes I wonder, and I'm certain uh, that our audience does the same. What would have happened had the non-Europeans been allowed uh, to define the human? And to answer this question, I'm going to probe European philosophy's historical antecedents in failing to account for non-whites as full human. And I start with the uh, piece uh, written by uh, Jürgen Habermas uh, very recently in the aftermath of the start of the massacre in Gaza, uh, where he takes issue with, quote, those in our country, to name Germany, where he's from, who have cultivated anti-Semitic sentiments and convictions behind all kinds of pretexts. And of course, we can commend Habermas for his fight against anti-Semitism, but we can equally condemn him for inadvertently reiterating an Olympics of oppression that pins certain forms of racism as more or less evil than others. At worst, his linear understanding of the world along a good but bad binary results in his inability to conceive of Jews and Muslims as willing neighbors or as comrades in the anti-colonial struggle, facts that seem to have slipped his mind. What's more, if we follow Habermas, condemning the actions of the Israeli state by contextualizing the events of 7 October is using his words, a pretext for anti-Semitism. He henceforth sits alongside those very Israeli generals and Zionists and evangelical pundits 
who angrily snap at TV hosts and guests whenever contextualizing is urged. But we shouldn't really be surprised at Habermas' take. Um, two decades earlier, in 2005, and against the backdrop of the looming war on Iraq, he equally erased Muslims and non-whites from the domain of the human in his articulations of his anti-war feelings in a piece co-written, sorry, uh, uh, with Jacques Derrida. I'm not a fan. And the piece is titled, What Binds Europeans Together? Plea for a Common Foreign Policy Beginning in Core uh, Europe. And in that piece, basically what Habermas and Derrida did, right, war is bad, et cetera, et cetera. But they presented Europe as post-national, post-racial, completely deaf um, to a continent whose history is entirely, as a, a continent that they depicted as its history being entirely sanitized from red. Um, eerily, though, there was no mention of the violences committed by Europe throughout its pre-modern, modern, and contemporary eras, particularly against its communities of migrants and people of color. From the colonial enterprise itself, to the horrors of the Holocaust, to the co-opting of ex-colony sovereignties during independence, ending with uh, present-day anti-migrant uh, policies. And um, I want to talk a little bit about the I guess the contradictions, right, that we all find ourselves uh, in right now. And believe it or not, when I first arrived at the UK in 2012, it was the first time I had heard even of Edward Said. Edward Said's work is almost antithetical to UK's foreign policy, but it is an extraordinary commodity for the ne neoliberal university. And At the UK university, the, I learned that gender literally makes the world go round, to borrow from Cynthia Enlow, that there is no gender without race, that endless social categories can be racialized and othered, that the economy itself is premised on which bodies do which work, at what time and where, that some bodies are disposable, that migrants are only well, well, welcomed as long as they confine themselves to specific jobs in certain spaces, that our privilege as political participants in the public sphere, ironically, is premised on the invisible care work and domestic labor that characterize the private sphere. That there is nothing wrong with my life, that Western knowledge is not the sole knowledge that matters, that our manners and emotive psyches are human, that every tinkling and visceral reaction over the past decade was my pathetic attempt at circumventing, avoiding, and appeasing whiteness. That my very life Life is the embodiment of critical race studies, that there are millions of us, that there are dozens of Palestines. Which brings me to this. To all the classics, humanities, and social sciences aficionados, which I'm presuming we all are here, where do we go from the 7th of October? Now that human rights are de facto a vacuous concept, now that contextualizing and historicizing are demonized and kindness criminalized, Many, many centuries ago, at the height of enlightenment, the works of uh, Waman Poma from South America and Otobaku Gowano from Ghana and the UK, um, and they both wrote on the human, let's say, on good governance, on non-extractivist capitalist um, endeavors. Both of them write at the height of enlightenment and both wrote directly uh, to the kings of Spain and the king of the UK, and I don't have the time to go over their work in details, but we learned from Walter Mignolo that their work was swiftly swept under the carpet to make more room for French philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau and co. And whilst Israel is today supported by the governments of the very states where enlightenment originated, they stand in sharp contrast, right, to the century old pluriversal humanity that these two not very known philosophers posited. Not only were they both well ahead of their times in terms of questioning universalist assimilationist logics, both wrote, um, both encapsulates the geo and body politics of knowing and understanding. 
ultimately their episteme or knowledge in Mignolo's words is simply quote, unknown in the geology of European thinking, end quote, which could explain Habermas inability to conceive of the human beyond his European uh, bubble. And I want to end by uh, also returning to Habermas. In 2015, he was initially uh, offered a very prestigious uh, book award, right, uh, uh, in the UAE. Um, uh, and uh, first he accepted it and then he turned it down. And uh, his excuse was that he did not realize clearly enough the relationship between the institution that awards this award in Abu Dhabi and the political system that prevails there in the UAE. By stating this, Habermas deems his version of here, not there, here, to name Germany's genocidal past as and growing right-wing trend as more human than the UAE's kafala system. What's more, he limits non-academic freedom to a specific UAE setting, which recalls in true European amnesia fashion, Germany's ongoing, ongoing systemic attack on any and all speech on Palestine. European philosophy is stuck in an either or view of the world, the very same view that has fueled its colonial endeavor, informed its enlightenment period, and continues to dominate world politics. It is not capable of comprehending the world as a pluriverse of contradictions that have the right to an opaque ontology, that knowing is finite, that the pluriverse is both the material, the immaterial, the human, the non-human, the East and the West, the rogue and the sober, the angry and the peaceful, not the either or uh, depiction that vulgar real politics would want us to believe and solidarity with Palestine. Thank you. Thank you, Sabia. Um, Santiago, and I'll put your slides up now. Thank you very much. First of all, I want to thank very much um, everyone uh, who has actually gathered us today here uh, for the possibility of actually engaging with this very, very important struggle in community international solidarity. I apologize, I just got COVID two, three days ago. So I try to actually offer some subtitles for my very, very bad voice here. And I want to particularly thank for the lineup that was put together here, because as I, you are going to see, the work of Palestine and Javier uh, before me had explained everything thing I want to explain today. So whatever you are going to actually uh, hear from me as a repetition is going to be because my colleagues have already offered this. Uh, in the same way that Palestine presented before, um, I have a question of how we can do as scholars to engage with a, a particular genocide that is ongoing and how we can actually respond to this level of suffering that is happening right now in real time. And the first question I can come up with is why it's so difficult to recognize this long-standing genocide that Palestinians today are suffering. Some people may argue that it's about real politics, stronghold of the powerful, or conspiracies. And without disregarding these possibilities, I would like to say that all this might or might not be possible, but they still need to be sustained by the power of narratives. And what is the particular narrative I want to explore today is what is called by Enrique Dussel, mostly um, uh, being influenced by Walter Benjamin, as I explained before, and other European Jews as a myth of modernity. And what is the myth of modernity? Is the conception of the West as a self-evident inheritor of the greco roman culture has always been the most advanced civilization and its violence is always redemptive, either to help and civilize to civilize or to punish and civilize for the threat to regress history. And this is exactly where the combination between what this collective does, critical ancient studies and the colonial studies, like Sahia present before, can actually make a contribution in order to dismantle every linkage you see of the myth of modernity. I am sure all of you can do much better most of the linkages I presented before, but today I want to emphasize on one linkage, which is 
the discussion of what is or what is not violence. And I will depart a little bit, as Sabhia did before, from this long 16th century that the first empire, Spain, um, developed in the simultaneous expulsion of Jews and Muslims from the continent and the colonization of Native and African can reproduce until today beyond time and space. So we can pass to the next slide. In this long 16th century, the redemptive violence was justified by dividing the world in three different parties. The first party was people with a true religion. This community was endowed with the ultimate truth that must bring the world to religious salvation. And as such, it's just war or violence has always been seen as redemptive. This true religion, it became in time through civilization, the Western, through economic development, capitalism, or through political organization, democracy. This was confronted by two different rivals. The first one was constructed through the rhetoric of Orientalism or competition. These people with the false religion were communities that they were described as being the wrong path, that consciously rejected or betrayed ultimate truth and are either stuck in time or actually working against civilization with open wars or conspiracies. As such, their violence is going to become a threat to redemptive advance of Christianity or civilization, capitalism as democracy. And as such as being a threat of this imperial difference, it might be destroyed. But there was a third community which are people who are presented as having no religion, and that was the pressure of Occidentalism. These are communities that fell off of the Christian map, and they have no relation or no intervention in history until they encounter the number one. As means the true religion, the true civilization, true economic development, or the true political organization. And as such, there are communities that fell off the Christian map, and the resources from labor, from land to labor, are going to become virgin terrains to fulfill the divine election or historical destiny or natural selection. Their reactive violence will be described as steam from regressive ignorance of the true form of civilization, economical or political organization. So they will need to be saved from their own leaders or they need to actually be helped to advance in civilization by destroying their communities. And this is going to be the indicator of a colonial difference. We can pass to the next stage. What I will argue today is the current Palestinian genocide is not able to be completely acknowledged by most of the world, especially the Western world, because they are, see, they are suffering the outcome of the myth of the modernity overlapping both rival civilization. Sometimes they are described as the people with the wrong path, and uh, such it might be destroyed. And sometimes they are described as the people whose own leaders are not allowing them to reach humanity, as Ahia was saying before. And as such, they need to be help, uh, in, uh, help um, uh, to overcome the leadership of, for example, Hamas, uh, uh, in order to actually achieve civilization and achieve humanity. So what I'm trying to say is that the Palestinian genocide is not able to be acknowledged, not only for a stronghold powerful, not only because of, um, of, uh, of real politics, but also because the Western world has set up a particular myth of modernity that makes unable for people to see a genocidal suffering when people are trapped in this myth of modernity. And to finish, I want to say what role Israel play here. And there are two different possibilities I would like to explore with you. The first possibility is that there was a change of strategy in order to continue with the same system. In the post-Holocaust era, normative jury has been incorporated into what is called the right religious civilization, now Judeo-Christian, and Israel represents, as Theodor Herzl uh, proposed, an outpost of Western civilization as opposed to barbarism. And as such, Israel is presented as the right civilization, the right politics, <coughs> sorry, the only democracy of the Middle East, the right economy, this uh, cutting edge technological power, 
And as such, they have earned the right of redemptive violence, the right of a state of exception, as Palestine was saying before. That there is another possibility I want to contemplate is that there is a change, uh, there is no change of strategy to continue the system. The fact is that the West has always imposed hierarchy on both those who suffer their narrative. As Abhia was saying before, is about, or Palestine, I think both of you, about emphasizing the Olympics of suffering. So disregarding that Western intervention created a problem, such as in Rwanda, that the colonial powers have imposed themselves in order to create a division that led on the lead to genocides, the two sides, Tutsis and Utus in Rwanda, or, or in this way, not only Israelis, but also Jews in general and Palestinians, are being seen as eternal enemies who cannot resolve the problems. And only the impartial objective West can. And as such, the West that's created the problem offers itself as the only impartial and objective mediator, but their intentions was never to solve a problem, but actually to create more and more abyss among sides. So it is not only that uh, the West is not is the creator of the problem, but now assign itself the possibility of a solution that they will never come in. And as such, the West, the, the problem is not about two sides. The problem is that there is one side that is too big to be seen. So to, to finish with this, what I want to say here is that in order to confront the problem of the ongoing genocide of Palestinians, it's very important the work that South Africa is doing by bringing Israel to court. It's very important how the nation states, some nation states in the global south are mobilizing for this, but it's not enough. We need to break the myth of modernity that occludes and justify redemptive suffering. Until we don't do and we break this myth of modernity, we are going to see some people as more human than the other, some violence as redemptive and some violence as regressive. And it is time to break the idea that there is only one path of redemption and Palestinians have the right to, to, uh, to set their own path for their own liberation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Santiago, and thank you for persevering, even though your voice at various points was trying to, to leave the room. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Salman. Thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you for organizing this event. Um, and of course, um, my joy at have, being at this event is mitigated by the fact there's a need to organize this event, given the circumstances that we live in. Having said that, um, I'm, I'm very conscious of the time, so I'm going to just make four points, and I hope that there is enough coherence with them to link them up there. The first thing I really wanted to do was really start off with a question, and uh, which is, how often do you think about the Roman Empire? Now, I realize this question would seem slightly odd in a uh, webinar full of classicists, um, but it is, um, some of you may be aware, a TikTok uh, meme that went around the world in which um, people were asked, uh, how often do you think of the Roman Empire? And many men, uh, most men, mainly men, replied at least once a day or sometimes even once a month. And the question is, well, why would you think about the Roman Empire once a month? Now, there's two things about this that immediately emerge. One, the centrality of the Roman Empire in popular culture. And believe me, the numbers of the TikTok meme, et cetera, were in some sort of hundreds of thousands, if not a million. And I'm sure the classicist field does not include hundreds of millions and hundreds of thousands, um, let alone that number. So clearly, there is something about the Roman Empire which seems to um, affect a certain notion of gendered uh, fascination with it. But also, perhaps, and it's not clear from the meme itself, whether one would say, is it all men? Uh, are, is there a, a racial element to it? Is there a class, a class element to it? All of these questions 
would have been really quite interesting. What does it actually mean to think about the Roman Empire every day? You could be like Niall Ferguson and fantasize about writing books about the Roman Empire, or it could be someone else thinking about escaping from Rome, etc. So the centrality of Rome has become a, a, a kind of a metaphor for being able to talk about the present, like all good science fiction, except it's in the past. Now, this leads me to the, really the question about thinking about classics. And I would like to suggest to you that perhaps classics are um, basically a formation uh, similar to origins, what origin stories are to comics. Uh, origin story for comics is really how a, a foundational narrative that explains why the protagonist, the hero, emerges and is distinct from the rest of humanity. It describes and establishes the, estab the exceptionality of the superhero. From Saragon to Moses to Superman, you have the origin stories of these individuals who appear, heroic figures, who are transformational of the world, but set apart from the world itself. And it seems to me that classics, in a way, does a similar kind of job. It is the origin story of the West, which is there in the world, making the world, but apart from the world. And of course, it's heroic. And it is um, fighting evil constantly. But its origins are such, it has no parentage. Um, it's orphan. It is or abandoned. And again, you know, um, Superman comes from a planet which has been destroyed. So he doesn't really have a parent, proper parents. Um, so it is quite interesting to look at the notion of classics as a way of thinking about the foundational narrative of the West. And I would say to you, as all foundational narratives, they are kept in play as long as what they're trying to found is continuous. In a way, a foundational moment is not a moment or an event, but a process. So it's a constant reinscription of the moment of foundation. And this is why when there have been um, challenges to that foundational narrative of um, classics, it is often um, screeted out of the academy and the sort of um, image that we have of senior common room conversations into the broader culture. One only needs to think about the horror um, represented by Black Athena or the idea more recently that there might have been so-called Black Romans in Britain who might not have just been playing sports or things like that and the shock that it caused and it was part of a general conversation. And of course, if all these people think about the Roman Empire, we know that we are no longer talking about just the um, academic seminars. So it seems to me that one of the things that we need to think about is the constant reinscription of the foundational narrative throughout various actions and the linking backwards and forwards. And here, the classic, the ability to establish the exceptionality becomes central because exceptionality is also a marker of boundaries. And there are a number of boundaries and Santiago already alluded to um, one of them in relation to the idea of the barbarian, which is, but in a way, the barbarian is part of the classical world because it is, it isn't at the end of the classical world. The classical world or the classical periodization ends problematically with the appearance of the Islamicate, which cannot simply be reduced to a moment of something external, untutored, etc. And there is an argument to be made that you could think about the Islamicate as a continuation or a reconfiguration. After all, we know that the second capital and perhaps the capital of the Roman, Repu Roman Empire for longer than Rome itself is now in Turkey. And it's, but that doesn't seem to matter if you go to um, York Museum, etc. The third point that I wanted to make really is to talk a little bit about um, good scholarship and bad scholarship. Whenever you raise questions around these issues about scholarship and how they interact with broader culture, you often get the response that good scholarship is about establishing the truth, telling the truth. Bad scholarship is about telling stories about interests and identities. But what I'd like to suggest to you is perhaps that distinction between good and bad scholarship isn't that helpful because as we've seen, classics itself and here, uh, Western epistemology itself, even though it claims to be about good scholarship telling the truth, when the decolonial movement asks the question, why is my curriculum white? 
why is the, uh, there is an issue here that the truth itself is not simply another way of talking about identity and interest, and it always has been. In which case, what we're talking about is no longer scholarship, but scholarship as gaslighting. And perhaps our critical efforts are really to interrupt that gaslighting that goes from uh, Guantanamo to Guaz, Gaza, to the past, to wherever. And I've run, run out of alliterative Gs. I could have said gold, but never mind. Uh, go there. But the final point that I want to make uh, is really to concentrate on the idea of Palestine, both ancient and contested and modern. And suggest to you, and picking up the point that has already been made, that in many ways, Palestine is matters to us and matters to the world because it is at the point where the colonial and the imperial and the Western are being played out with the greatest intensity. The reason why South Africa and so many other um, governments and peoples who have no connection, no effective connection with Palestine shows that there is something about Palestine which transcends immediate self-interest. If the only people who cared about Palestinians and Palestinians were fellow Palestinians, you would not have hundreds and thousands and millions of people demonstrating every week across the world. And one sign of politicization of something is the moment that it moves from self-interest to a general interest. The fact that we are interested in Palestine because we are not Palestinian makes it not less important, but more important, because it becomes a marker of something better. It becomes a marker of a mobilization, which is actually sees how the attempt to stitch the history of the present back and reenact the foundational narrative of the origin story of the West is a way of talking about Palestine as complete westernization, the westernization of Palestine. And that means, paradoxically, the dehumanization of everyone, because Palestinianization is dehumanization right now. And therefore, because the classics underwrites the story of the universal, but, and the universal, of course, has particularities bounded by the nature of the classics. What is not class contained within the classics cannot be what is universal. And because it cannot be universal, ultimately it cannot be human. And hence, Palestine and Gaza right now name the point where that lack of the universal is being enacted. And at the same time, the point of contention where others are challenging the possibility of a new universal, which doesn't take us through the foundational narratives of the West. Thank you. Thank you, Salman. Um, I was thinking as you were speaking of that protest chant with which we are now all extremely familiar, um, the the political statement in our thousands, in our millions, we are all Palestinians, or I think now probably in our millions, in our billions, we are all Palestinians. I think that's where we're at, um, which provides me with a segue to Aditi's work. Aditi. Thank you all. Um, I'm, I'm honored to, to cap off this exceptional, exceptional roundtable um, with a few words on how we might move and collect ourselves from thinking about the scholastic ramparts that undergird Palestinianism um, into action um, and what action looks like in the spate of academic work um, and the university as a system itself. Uh, I'll footnote this briefly by saying uh, first that I am uh, an academic based in the West, which means that the resources and tools that I draw upon are largely coming from this world that I'm familiar with. And I apologize for, for the movements that I'm unaware of that are likely alive and well. And a second note to say that any everything that I talk about will be circulated uh, with links attached um, following the presentation itself. Um, so I'd just like to start by saying that the university is, is 
a privileged landscape. Um, it is an immensely, immensely resourced body, not just in terms of the kinds of individuals who pass through, um, but the actual financial entanglements that the university provides and lends to everybody who's involved on it. Um, it is highly disingenuous to paint the narrative that the university just became uh, inflamed on October 7th, when universities have always been on fire. Uh, from movement to movement, um, the youth of the world have located themselves in different formations and assemblages on university campuses uh, to protest, to learn together, and to collectively organize. Um, and so what I'd like to do today also is to place what is happening right now with Palestinian liberation in a long, long, long trajectory of campus protest that are all built together and acting in deep, deep ingrained solidarity. Uh, this means with black liberation, this means with abolition, prison abolition, um, this means with fossil fuel divestment. These are these are entrenched in what it is that is trying to be accomplished right now. Um, so I'm going to start on the very big, broadest level and, and suggest a couple of options um, through which one might boycott. Now, boycotting is is the single uh, largest collective effort um, to hold accountable um, the Israeli state and all those who partake and participate and make profit off of it. Um, the largest academic uh, boycott that we can all sign on to is called PACB, um, the Palestinian Academic and Cultural Boycott of Israeli Institutions. Um, now, what is very critical to note about boycotts, and I'd like to make this exceptionally clear today so it's not um, misconstrued in some listserv, uh, is that when we th talk about boycotts, we're talking about divestment from institutions, um, from projects of cultural work that are based in certain localities, but not from people. So when you sign on to something like PACB, you are saying I am divesting from giving a talk at Tel Aviv University, but I am not refusing to work with a colleague who is based at that university, right? We must put the pressure on institutions that are perpetrating genocide and not punish individuals who are who are citizens of these states. This is an exceptionally clear line to draw. Um, a great boycott one can sign on to and one that holds a lot of uh, sway for those who work in ancient history um, is strike Germany. Now, Germany is a state that has been exceptionally complicit um, and, and hugely, hugely treacherous in the kinds of censorship that it has been enforcing. Um, as academics right now, it is exceptionally important that we pull back from the all engagement with G German cultural institutions and universities. We feel the pinch of this. I'm sure there's many people in the audience who have talks, conferences, groups that are working and meeting in Germany regularly. Um, and because German uh, scholars cannot make the decision uh, to voice pro-Palestinian opinions because they cannot safely express these views, it is on us in the international community to put the pressure on the state as international culture workers. It is on us to uphold that responsibility. Moving from these kinds of broad umbrella levels to more actionable things on your campus. Uh, if you are a faculty member, I highly, highly encourage you uh, to either join the Faculty for Justice in Palestine uh, collective at your university, or if it does not exist, to start one. Um, FJPs are critical hand in hand with SJPs, Students for Justice in Palestine, um, associations of, of faculty members who disrupt the university's constant myth that it is uh, them neutral and pacified against a radical body of students. Uh, FJP provides an interruption that says faculty are on the side of the students, not only in protecting their right to assemble and to speak freely, uh, but ourselves are committed to the act of liberation. Um, FJP chapters have been instrumental at universities like Columbia, where students are regularly dragged to disciplinary hearings, and it is FJP members, faculty, uh, who walk with these students to their meetings, who sit on their meetings with them. And so um, building these collectives are essential. Um, and also on a university level, uh, the call has been clear for quite some time for there to be Palestinian studies departments. Now, universities are just realizing uh, that um, Zionism is an intellectual problem right, uh, that the tools for understanding this kind of political violence can also be rendered by the classroom, by, by scholarship. And this is what we are constantly taught as academics is that the solutions to, to political strife can exist within our grasps. Uh, and whether I believe that or not is aside from the fact that we should provide these intellectual spaces to 
to take that point to its fullest. Palestinian studies departments have long existed um, at Brown, at Columbia, at SOAS, at Exeter, and these have been incredibly critical sites for hiring Palestinian faculty, for bringing in graduate students who would not otherwise be able to engage in, in, in the university, and for providing spaces uh, to have the kinds of programming and coursework that is necessary for lending the next generation the tools by which to understand the stakes of the ongoing apartheid and genocide. Uh, the terms of these words, it, it is exceptionally important to understand in the fray of the classroom, um, that's what we're here to do, uh, and Palestinian studies departments are an essential role in building this together, put pressure on your universities to do so. Um, and then the last thing I'd like to, to say is that as classicists, um, what we can also do is is take the take the stride that, um, for example, anthropologists did in July of 2023, and uh, Asian Americanists did in 2013, um, and have and put a call towards our professional associations. That's to say, the SCS, the SOR, the AIA, um, to sign on to BDS referendums. Now, the calls for these referendums for the institutions that represent us as a whole to collectively divest from the Israeli state. This means disallowing Israeli universities from posting jobs on job boards or from posting their conferences on, on shared sites and listservs. Um, this is exceptionally important for putting the necessary sanctions on for the Israeli state to realize that it cannot be a part of this intellectual cultural exchange if it continues the work of apartheid, if it continues to enact policies of genocide. Um, and in the last couple of minutes here, what I'd, what I'd like to stake out is, is a model for a liberatory politic that we might choose to adopt. Now, these things that I've just mentioned have been built up by, by generations and generations of activists on the ground. They did not come together overnight. Um, and a lot of people are waiting for the call. You know, a lot of, a lot of people say, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a graduate student. I'm a professor and I don't know what to do. Um, and the truth is that it is on us to autonomously and emergently organize. All of the tools to do so are strictly at our disposal. Um, for example, uh, there are so many individuals right now who simply don't have access to the texts. Uh, that Western libraries are full of uh, to redistribute the PDFs uh, to give away the knowledge that we have uh, infinite access to and that other people have incredibly, incredibly constrained access to. Um, imagine if, if we could provide PDFs to everybody who's looking for them all the time. Um, the, the kind of creative banditry that the university enables us to take on is exceptionally critical as we consider redistribution as a central mechanism of organization. Um, Beyond this, there are uh, communities that cannot hold spaces. Um, universities have endless rooms and auditoriums. Um, let let individuals know that you will book them a room, that that you will let their their group hold its space. Uh, that a group of student organizers who need a who need a safe space to discuss a disruptive action that they are planning can have a room to do so. Um, these are the kinds of critical, critical, small actions that you can open the doors for. Uh, Zoom accounts, um, who has access to a space that can have 300 individuals encryptedly meet for as long as they would want? It's, it's us with .edu's. Um, the, the constant giving away of the resources that we are, we, are, we are just granted quite freely is a necessary, necessary part of, of building a movement that has the collective power. Um, and I'd like to end on this note of saying autonomous organizing means that we all have skills and resources uh, that are immensely variegated. And that is, that is the, the beauty of the cultural system um, that we are kind of confined to in our day-to-day -day workplace. Um, and what that means is like building upon that and organizing uh, autonomously and by yourself without somebody telling you what to do in ways that serve and meet the call for Palestinian liberation day to day. If you are holding a conference in the next few days, um, I call on you to start and end with moments of silence. If you are having class on a national strike day, cancel your class. Um, you know, these, these are things that can easily be facilitated by the work of scholarship, 
without us having to write, without us having to speak, but by us taking the small steps of our, of our day to day careers in order to turn over and give space for the movements to take on their own form. We are all organizers in this space, um, and I hope that everybody who spoke before me uh, has inspired the, the collective space to answer the call uh, to disrupt and to organize in every single avenue that we are provided. Great, thank you, Aditi, and thank you for, for breaking down what often seems like an extremely complex network of different kinds of, of organizations um, and different sorts of work into actually a, a series of very, very practical steps. Thank you ever so much, everyone, uh, for these really, really fascinating presentations. Um, I can see lots of questions already coming in. Uh, if attendees do want to start putting more questions into the Q&A box, um, I'd love to invite you to do that. We are not likely to be able to answer everybody's question, um, but I will uh, talk less myself so we can try and get to some more of them. So I'll, I'll um, hold back on my thanks for just a minute and I'll start reading out some questions. I'm gonna start with this one, uh, which is about um, archeological findings. So I'm gonna come first to you, Georgia, and then to you, Isbeth. The question is, I've often seen, seen Zionists say that archeological findings across Israel and Palestine overwhelmingly demonstrate the rich history and presence of Jews on the land, but completely overlook the heritage of Palestinians or other peoples. How would you respond to this? Georgia, do you wanna go first? So currently in Gaza, there is over 300 known archeological sites from multiple chronological periods. And I think it what the common mentions is a very well-documented practice taking place in Israel where there is a preference for archaeological sites that uh, confirm the national narrative of Israel. So it remains true that there is emphasis on certain chronological periods and it's extremely politicized and it's directly and openly serving the national project. Yeah, I mean, this, this, it was used years and years ago that, you know, the Sonarists, they always tried to use archaeology to give them a legitimacy. And um, again, I mean, uh, we saw that over all of uh, centuries, you know, uh, we, uh, Gaza and all Palestine, it was, it is, and it will be a place for the diversity for Muslims, Christians, and Jewish. I mean, uh, even, I mean, there is an, a colleague in Israel, he worked with an uh, uh, NGO, Amik Shabib, Shabib I, I am not, is, uh, if I pronounced it in Hebrew, they work against this idea, you know, so, so the Palestinian, they have as well, I mean, they are also the owner of this land with their heritage. We really, I mean, uh, 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 believe that uh, uh, Palestinian, I mean, they were, and we have, I, unfortunately, they use archaeology to uh, 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 support their political uh, 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 their political uh, narratives, the, the, the Sunnis. But again, I mean, uh, this is, uh, 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 we really, I mean, uh, 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 as archaeologists and people who are working on this area, we know that uh, this is uh, uh, something fake and was used uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to 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 give them a legitimacy. Um, we we know, and uh, even I mean, our there are Palestinians, Jewish, they were in this land and they were living in. Peace and in harmony with their neighbors, with the Christians, with the, there are a lot of documentaries and a lot of stories talking about uh, uh, about this. And now, especially in the West Bank, we are really very worried about what is happening. You know, especially in Nablus, in Tolkaram, in Janine. You know, there are even now a lot of threats to uh, uh, religious sites. You know, we uh, 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 we really need as well to give attention. To the uh, risk and to the uh, 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 which could happen as well in the West Bank, and especially to the sites which are somehow uh, 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 having as well uh, 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 El Khalil, for example, you know, 
we need really to 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 be aware that uh, the situation in Gaza will not uh, affect it as well in the heritage sites as well in West Bank. Mm, thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, I have a question now that is about this idea of perfect as the origin story of the West. So I think I'm coming to you, uh, Salman, first and then to Santiago. The question is, um, how do we balance concerns of emphasizing the continuity between the Roman Empire and the Islamic world and those of criticizing the imperial and colonial violence of the Roman Empire itself and its legacies in contributing to the myth of modernity and its ideologies of redemptive violence? And if you don't mind, we just jump I'm, I'm going to preface this while you um, think, I'm sure the answer comes to you immediately, but um, many humans need time to think, so I'm going to give you some time. Um, I'm going to preface this by, by saying one answer to this question or, or one constellation of answers to this question is embedded within the project of Critical Ancient World Studies. Um, Critical Ancient World Studies is not a classics project. It's a project um, of remaking the study of the ancient world uh, critically so that it functions um, as the pretext to a decolonial future and not to a colonial present. So rather than expand now on um, the tenets of critical ancient world studies, I would just invite you, if you are thinking about these questions around classics as the origin of Western civilization or how we uncouple some of these really harmful connections between Westernness and classicalness, um, you might want to engage with some of our work, with us, with the book, um, any of those things. But with that purpose out of the way, um, someone. Um, I I would just I would have just mentioned the same thing. I would have said, to, um, you know, uh, this is the work for critical ancient world studies. But just to make quick points on this, it's, it's it's an important topic and it's a big topic. We have seen elements of classical um, studies expand their gaze from what would used to be constituted, let's say, the 19th century, etc. So you have classic study, studies of sexualities, gender, all of these things. So the issue really isn't to expand the remit of classical studies by doing more topics or make an empirical exp um, expansion, but really to rethink where it stands in relation to the rest of the world. And here, I think the question about the formation becomes important. So while you know, I have nothing against the study of the Roman Empire uh, at all, nor do I think we need to romanticize um, either the Roman Empire or the non-Roman Empire or non-Roman uh, non-empires or imperial people. I think the question about violence and cruelty and injustice and how they're distributed is an open question rather than linked to a particularly very tight framing of these things. We should not just be completely um, unaware or uncritical of saying, well, of course, the Roman Empire was a violent and rapacious um, organization. Um, but, you know, what did the Romans ever do for us kind of question isn't really the one that we want to go or the uh, one that, you know, well, the Islamic was worse or better, et cetera, than that. It's just to work out the different kinds of configurations and see well, what happens if we don't think of the ending of the classical in the appearance of the Islamicate. What does it change if all identity is relational? then different kinds of identifications open up different configurations. So we're really talking about the disarticulation of the notion of the classical rather than simply a continuation or a contestation about what is the proper terminus of it. I don't know, Santiago, you want to add to this? Uh, no, first of all, you know, probably very little after Abdel Salman has explained this very well. I would just say that virtually every time we talk about this, we finish with Monty Python. You know, and what the Romans have done. Maybe we should start with Monty Python. There's absolutely no way to avoid that, especially when we do it in the UK. But I think it is important to especially talk about the cultural appropriations and how culture has been able to create um, uh, collective unconsciousness about certain things. And Monty Python is the way that we explain. And this is how I see the laugh of many people. They know what they are talking about. Uh, I would just say that um, uh, one of the most successful um uh, successful uh or successes of modernity of western modernity has been to touch virtually every aspect of our lives there is virtually no aspect that hasn't been touched by the country of western modernity so the idea that we are going to find a particular field of study that is going to be devoided 
from being touched by Western modernity is actually called for a purism that we none of us should be even aspire to have. There is nothing pure. Now, there is certain kind of there is certain critical traditions that have, have been touched, but they haven't been swallowed by the system. And as critical traditions have not only resisted, but also created re-existences. And this is where I believe our emphasis should be. Uh, whatever every field will do to contest the resources of coloniality between the traditions is something each one of us need to, to, uh, to think as critiques between each one of these disciplines. But I will just say that um, I wouldn't abandon a field of study just because we see how clearly has contributed to uh, uh, to colonialism and imperialism modernity, because all of them have. All of them have. The question is, returning with what Salman was saying, is what do we do with it? So, and I believe that I'm taking this from Salman himself, uh, when at some point it says, um, whatever answer we are going to find, perhaps sometimes the question is more important. So perhaps our role will not be to find all the answers. I am sure a lot of people are here smarter than myself and can find all the answers. I will not find all the answers, but I can ask the right question to start to dismantle that, um, uh, that permeation that all the fields have Western modernity. So I would just say is that ask questions, ask questions, integrate, 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 and someone will help us finding the answers. Great, thank you. Um, I think ask questions and do it collectively also. You're not sat on your own. You know, both of these projects that have organized this event today are very much collective projects. So, um, you know, join them in asking those questions too. Um, so yeah, I have a question here for you. The question is uh, from Isan. The question is, what would the post-European or Western conception of the human be like? How far would it be different uh, from the European liberal humanism conception that you presented? So, I mean, essentially a big question, right? What other models for humanity have we got? Or are there problems with all models for humanity? Um, what advice could you give? Um, it's a very interesting question, and um, I think um, uh, my colleagues here uh, already touched, um, you know, touched uh, on it, particularly uh, uh, Salman and Santiago, right? And it's this whole, you know, okay, yeah, we have issues, right, with the the very racialized understanding of the human that Enlightenment gave us, but. Um, how do we know, right, that we can measure every single conceptualization of the human somewhere, right? And so it's not really about, <clears throat> we can be utopic, of course, right? Uh, transformative in our politics, in our ways of thinking, shifting paradigms, etc. But I think ultimately, it's really about dismantling, right, the myth of the superiority of anything and everyone, right, that's uh, Western. And to show that there is room, right, for multiple views of the world, multiple ways of thinking, of being, right, uh, going uh, uh, about your life. And it's no wonder, right, why all of us here are seen as troublemakers. Um, I'm sure we... Each one of us knows at least a dozen people who are being harassed constantly for their politics, especially when the work we do made it, you know, into the mainstream. Because the whole system, right, is literally premised on the colonial past, the neoliberal um, open market, right, the economy that sustained the world. It's a political economy. It, you know, it's not just an economy, right? It's not just politics. It's a it's very difficult to blur the line between, you know, the material and the immaterial. But we should remind ourselves, and this is why our work is important, all throughout the ages, someone, somewhere, thought about the human. And not everyone 
enforce right their views or understanding of it upon others and yeah of course we can think about uh, you know how the human becomes the political instruments for civilization civilization and progress and conquest etc but um, there are a few of them right um, but with such a hyper connected world today right yeah there's a lot of undoing work basically that has to uh, be done and uh, yeah it's a very shambolic answer because it's a very big question <laughs> but uh, plurality plurality if i were to sum it up uh, in one word thank you thank you for um trying with that like enormous question uh that was asked to you we are approaching the time when we need to wrap up but before we do that uh i want to address uh, a question that has been asked in the chat about the political and the political nature of education I'll read out the question, then I want to contextualize it a little bit. And then I think I'm going to come first to you, Aditi, because you haven't spoken yet in the Q&A, then perhaps to Salman as the resident political theorist in the room, um, and then to, to a couple of others. I'm sure that everyone has a view on this question. Derek's question is, um, doesn't the trial of Socrates demonstrate that education has always been political? I also can't stand how many white classicists can ignore the etymological roots and definition of political, as from the ancient Greek, as anything that occurs within or impacts the community of the polis, as opposed to what happens inside the private home. Now, to be clear, I'm less interested in this question from the point of view of etymology um, than I'm interested in it from the point of view of the politics of scholarship. This week has been, after all, a week in which the organizers of this event have seen firsthand the number of uh, particularly senior figures in classics and classical studies who believe their discipline to be absolutely apolitical and in fact see it as a kind of affront to the discipline for anybody like the organizers of this event to present it as something that has political ramifications and that can make um, kind of political engagement with the world. So that's what I'm interested in hearing then to close this meeting is how political is scholarship slash education slash classics? Um, and how do we best harness that political nature? I'm assuming nobody's going to say that it's not at all political, in which case I shall kick you off the Zoom. Um, but how do we best harness some of that political power um, for liberation? Aditi, let's come to you, first of all. Yeah, I, I will quote here the, the, the ineffable words of Fred Moten, who said, um, one cannot deny that a university uh, is is not a place for enlightenment, but one also cannot deny that it is a place for refuge. And the kind of refuge that all of us have taken within the university system, this is uh, refuge from everything as mundane as student loans uh, to, to, the real, to the real intellectual weight of, of what it is that we study. Um, it, is, it is critical to understand that we ourselves, when we think about the university, are not entrenched in a, in a singular like cell, um, but a connected ecosystem that has huge ramifications for how it is that people interpret the worlds around them. Um, and that we are not arbiters of truth, but rather engaged in a very collective project of, of remaking um, and coming to terms with the very reality that we live in um, to hopefully implot a, a future that is slightly more ethical, slightly more inhabitable. Um, this is why universities become sites for, for labor protests, the, the origins of some of the greatest liberation movements that we have seen is that these 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 small cells uh, have the capacity to really explode outwards if we give it space and time to do so so it is political and all, all the better for it thank you and um, someone yeah just very quickly um two points if we imagine what would have been the fate of socrates if he had loved lived under the Achaemenids rather than under athens and that, it seems to me, is probably a, quite a good way of thinking about the question about the political in two ways. Firstly, it's unlikely that they would have probably had to be forced to drink hemlock, if nothing else, simply because the Achaemenids didn't really care that much, um, as long as you, they could rule over people who had no god, one god, any god, etc. But the idea, of course, is that the Persians were despots and Athens is democracy. And that in itself is not a simple uh, description of a truth. It is politically contested. So to the broader question about the political and the relationship between education, I think if the political is defined by antagonism, if it's defined by conflict, then any work, critical work, will be, there will be a political aspect to it. 
there will be a rhetorical aspect to it. It is about persuading people, as we are trying to persuade people around critical Asian world studies or anything like that, or particular kind of views. So there's an art of persuasion here. And there are different kind of mechanisms to do this. We only talk about education when the political questions have been uh, settled. When we are trying to teach, for example, um, primary school teachers how to count, um, not teachers, children, how to count, there's not much point in talking about two plus two equal five, as they did in the Stalin's five-year plans, for example. So the question about what constitutes numbers, what constitutes settlement, is really about when something is de depoliticized. And we're living in an age where it seems to me that the, uh, the, the dawning of the post-Western is epistemologically undergirding and un subverting many of the certainties which made the disciplinary formations and the university itself have the shape and it's, uh, as it does now. And these questions are being asked, and therefore the politicization of the university is not about the intrusion of something external, but is actually internal to the formation of because the real questions are, what does it mean to be a discipline? What, are the, what does it mean to count as knowledge? How should all of that be organized? These are no longer settled because the system that allowed them to be settled is fraying under its own weight, under many a different pressures. So it seems to me that education in a broader sense and the political could never be separated because part of education is involved in persuasion and you only persuade people which you disagree with. So the only thing that you can do is domesticate and try and formulate a certain kind of adab or idea or certain kind of etiquette around how you actually conduct that kind of conflict or antagonism, rather than refusing the idea of antagonism and conflict itself. So we should embrace the political and embrace the politics that allows us to live with the political. Thank you. And I hope that everybody uh, who were in their hundreds in my inbox telling me that classics shouldn't be political has been listening to you very, very carefully. Um, does anybody else want to come in on this question of political before I wrap up? No, I think we've said for now at least what needs to be said. Um, before we wrap up, I've just put very quickly on the screen here um, some of the things that you can do if you want to carry on some of these conversations. As Aditi said, we will circulate uh, some other recommendations, particularly those that are focused around organizing and action. There is an open letter um, that will also circulate um, in solidarity with Palestine that people can sign should they wish to. Um, and we'll circulate a number of other uh, more practical recommendations too. If you want to carry on having some of these conversations, uh, you might want to join us, that's to say us, the Critical Ancient World Studies Collective, at some of our um, events. We have a workshop coming up on February the 1st, and we're also launching our book, that's the one you can see in glorious Technicolor on the slide there, um, on February the 21st in a hybrid event, so you can either come uh, and see us in Exeter at Exeter University, or you can join us online. You might also want to follow the work of Everyday Orientalism. You can do that via their website. Um, I put the link there, but we'll also circulate it uh, after this webinar. You might especially be interested in looking at one of their past talks, um, which is a talk entitled Ancient Studies, Heritage and War, um, which was framed mostly around heritage destruction in Ukraine. Um, but might be interesting to think about in terms of parallels with some of the conversations that we've been having today. Um, thank you ever so much, all of you, uh, for joining us, all 400 of you, I think we had um, at, at the height uh, of, of attendance. Um, there will never be enough time, of course, to give these conversations the time that they need, um, but I'm glad that we've been able to have this conversation and glad that you were able to join us. Let me say an enormous, enormous thank you uh, to all of the speakers. I know that this is not uh, either an easy time of year or an easy political moment in which to make the time uh, to write, to speak, to engage. Um, but we're very, very grateful that you did. Thank you ever so much. Um, thank you also to, to all of my co-organizers of this event. Um, thank you, Madara. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Osama. Thank you also to Holly and Sam, who've been um, in the wings waiting to moderate had anybody uh, behaved themselves badly and needed any moderation. Um, as you know, there was some hostility around this event, so it was very, very important to us to make these conversations safe and make it so that, that, that people could express themselves and exercise their academic freedom openly. As you know, academic freedom... Uh, um, whenever it needs to be protected requires an entire team of people to protect it. So thank you uh, to those who've been part of that team today. 
Uh, thank you, Abdullah, uh, for your wonderful uh, translation. Um, and thank you also to the, the University of Toronto's Hearing Palestine project um, that allowed us to uh, bring Abdullah to translate for Fadl and will, of course, uh, write to Fadl on all of our behalfs and thank him for joining us today and for his incredibly brave work documenting the destruction of heritage in the region more generally. Um, a few, a last vote of thanks then, I suppose, uh, to the Liverpool Classicist Listserv, who in their endless abuse of me and my co-organisers this week, provided us with huge amounts of publicity for this event, such that we were able to have nearly 800 people signed up to, at to attend and to listen uh, to the recording. So we'll circulate the recording to those who are here and also to those who weren't able to be here. And we're grateful um, to everybody who said awful things and in saying awful things meant that this event could not be ignored as it rightly should not have been. And thank you finally to, to everybody who has joined us for making the time. Um, we hope that this is the beginning of a movement. We hope that this is uh, the moment when all of you as academics, if you aren't already thinking this, think that organizing for the liberation of the Palestinians is crucial and urgent and needs to be done all on all fronts immediately. Um, I hope that we have inspired you to go away um, and do that. Um, and I hope that it won't be the last time that we speak. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm going to close the webinar now. Uh, thank you all again for joining us.